<laughs> Very good. Great, Chris, thank you for joining us. And the way we're gonna do this today is um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about VR Engage, our first person role player application, uh, and talk about how we've integrated GL Studio, the DISTI product into that, show you some examples of that. Uh, and then we'll hand it over to, to Chris for the second half of this and let him actually show you some of the, the framework of GL Studio, how it works, how the building of these different UIs uh, takes place. And then again, the, the integration of that UI building into the broader simulation environment. So, um, so again, uh, just as a, as a way of kicking off things, we've got about 48 <coughs> people on the call today. Um, how many people are, are user interface, you know, cockpit type displays, vehicle interiors, you know, being able to touch and push buttons in a simulation. How important is that? How much for users, uh, how many people is that an important element to the type of simulation work they're doing? I'd be curious to, to hear that. And again, um, if you haven't been on one of these yet, um, we welcome anybody to unmute your mic and feel free to, to shout out your answer. Um, you can also use the chat window in Zoom that if you bring that up, you can type in a, uh, 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 a note in the chat window and uh, we'll be having various people for mock monitoring that. So, Thanks, uh, Craig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's great input here from uh, very important. Lots of people, vehicle, HMI, great. Um, so great, please keep that coming. While we're doing that, and before I get started, let me introduce a few other mock folks that are on the phone. Dan, you wanna introduce yourself? Dan Brockway, our VP of Marketing. So you just did, that's me. Well, there you I'm go, that's VP you. Marketing <laughs> and Information Systems at Mock. I've been with Mock for 13 years or so now and um, enjoying these lunches because I think it gives us an opportunity to, as Danny said at the beginning, just have some adult time. I know some of us are cooped up at our houses and need to get out a little. So welcome everybody. I think this will be an interesting conversation. We're starting to spread out a little bit. We've been inviting guests, Chris today, our first. And then we, this week we're doing intercontinental breakfast so that on uh, nine o'clock Thursday morning in, uh, in Asia, in Singapore time we call it, and then around noon in Australia, we'll have a, an opportunity for them to join in with us. And we know lots of people show up in the UK in the evening, so pr we appreciate that. And uh, yeah, that's me and us. Very good, thank you. And we've also got Rob Hamilton, part of our marketing team as well. Uh, hi, Rob, how's it hey, going? Pretty good, how's it going, guys? Going Just wanted on. to say hello. I am the marketing comic manager uh, at Mock. Um, been there about five years. And uh, I'm the one that sends you all your emails. If you have any questions about our email stuff, feel free to shoot me. Uh, an email in response. Um, and uh, we're always interested in getting feedback from you guys on what kind of topics you're interested in. Uh, a couple of these this week are actually suggestions from our team, specifically Wargaming. It's tomorrow. We have Wargaming Wednesday. Wargaming and Wednesday, uh, that's right. that was requested by many people. So that's, uh, you know, your feedback is always considered. Thanks for coming. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Rob. And I know we've got a few other folks from, um, from Mock On. Um, there's a big list, so I haven't found specific, but if anybody wants to shout out a hello, feel free. I'm not going to call you out this time, Gene. <laughs> you see, but you did call her out, and so now oh. she's like trying to unmute her mic. There she is. <laughs> I am. Here Hi, I Jean. am. Hi, Gene. How uh, are you? Hi, Chris. Hello, young lady. <laughs> So we've all known each other now for almost 17 years. Wow, that's crazy. Wow, very so, good. Thank very you. Good. I'm happy to see Chris. Go T and all. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I really enjoyed these times, and I'm glad to see so many people just keep coming. Yeah, So definitely. thank you for that. Yeah, large. We've always been very uh, uh, pleasantly surprised by the international you know, contingent of folks that are showing up. So definitely appreciate you guys joining. And again, we're going to try and do one a little bit closer to a normal time for you guys on uh, – on Thursday morning or Wednesday night, um, but we'll, we'll send out details for that as well. <clears throat> All right, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. We've got a good, uh, good crowd here. Again, today's topic is talking about human in the loop simulation, um, how and it, we go about building interfaces and building simulation systems that, that put a human at the center of it so that they can experience the virtual environment, interact with the virtual environment. Again, we've got numbers of different use cases of why we do that. Um, oftentimes it's a training type exercise. There are other examples. We're not gonna so much talk about those use cases, but more specifically show some examples of that technology and talk about kind of under the hood within mock products, how we achieve that. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. 
And we've talked quite a bit um, about VR Engage. VR Engage is our uh, first person role player application. Let me get my screens all squared away here. And um, so this is an application that we've built. Um, it's built on top of our visualization rendering uh, engine called VR Vantage, as well as our simulation engine called VR Forces. Um, the, it came about because uh, for many years we had customers, we would go to ITSEC and other shows like that, and we would build a demo. We'd take VR Forces and VR Vantage and we'd build a cockpit simulator or a UAV you know, sensor operator uh, 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 demonstration. And over time, customers would continually ask, hey, how do, where do I buy that? Where do I buy your cockpit simulator or your UAV you know, sensor operator station? And we were like, well, we don't really, that's not a thing we sell. We sell VR Forces and we sell VR Vantage and you can use those toolkits to build it. We, several years ago, said, you know, we should sell that. And VR Engage is sort of the, the outcome of that. VR Engage specifically takes the two, two toolkits for VR Forces and VR Vantage and builds a, a specific human in the loop role player application. So we can um, have aircraft, have ground vehicles, have dismounted soldiers, and you can step into the role of any one of those. And again, participate in whatever, whatever exercise it happens to be. Oftentimes for us, that's, that uh, happens to be a training type application. We frequently are connecting up multiple people in, in those types of applications. So if we're flying aircraft, there might be four or five of us. Uh, if we're on the ground, it might be a platoon, whatever the makeup might be. So those are all networked together. Um, but again, when you're in that role, depending on what, which role you're talking about, the, the user interface is very important to, um, to get right. Um, for a human dismount, you know, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. You're just kind of looking out, you know, at the world. But when you get into the interior of vehicles, be it ground vehicles or aircraft, um, having the representation of, uh, of the interior of that, uh, that platform look and, and behave correctly is very important. And so that's really what we're gonna focus on today. So the, the demonstration that I've, um, I'm gonna just quickly kind of go through um, is, uh, this is this is VR Engage with a very simple um, scenario. We've got a number of T-38 aircraft, training uh, aircraft um, that, that pilots, you know, initially learn to fly jet, um, jet aircraft in. Uh, and we've built a user interface for that using DISTY's GL Studio product. So when we talk about all of the gauges and instrumentation that you see in a cockpit, 99% um, of the time, what, when we build that type of uh, cockpit interior, we are using the GL, St GL Studio package to build gauges and dials, whoops, my, um, to build the gauges, the multifunction displays, you know, uh, all the instrumentation. We're using that, uh, that tool to build that. We've done the integration kind of under the hood at the VR Vantage level so that those things, once they're created in VR, excuse me, in GL Studio, they can come directly into a, a VR Vantage or a VR Engage cockpit display. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start uh, a, a quick example of that. Again, I have just a scenario here where we've got a couple of T-38 aircraft flying around. In VR Engage, I can select any one of these and choose to engage as it. And the other important piece that I'm gonna walk through as we do this is show the different configurations um, that we can do for this aircraft. So I'm gonna start with a pretty simple one. This is just a one screen horizontal, obviously shows up very nicely because I only have one screen that I'm sharing with you. Um, and um, shows, uh, you know, this is now I'm in the interior um, of this T-38. Now, uh, just, I'll talk through a couple of pieces of this. I'm gonna turn on my autopilot so I don't have to worry about um, uh, crashing this thing as we go. Um, all right, there we go. That's a pretty funny cockpit for a T-38, don't you think? You're, uh, you're absolutely right. It is a pretty funny cockpit. So um, this is obviously not 100% representative of what the interior of the T-38 looks like, but part of what we wanted to be able to do in VR Engage and part of what GL Studio allows us to do is to have different screen configurations. So depending on what kind of equipment I have uh, available to me screen-wise, I might want to have different configurations. Part of the beauty of the GL Studio product is that the, this, the various elements, uh, you know, multifunction displays and gauges that you see here are built once in GL Studio. We connect them up on the simulation side and then I can reconfigure them in a number of different ways for, you know, for different platforms. So this is a single view. I don't have a lot of, dip, uh, a lot of screens to show it on. I'm going to say, let me, let me build sort of this compact uh, 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 interface here that has my important gauges, two multifunction displays um, that I can then use. It also has the heads up display. 
um, that I can that I can interact with as well. Now, part of VR, part of what VR Engage allows you to do is to have different configurations. So if I had multiple screens, I'll show you that in a second. I can have a different configuration. If I'm using VR, if I'm using a head-mounted display, which I'm going to demonstrate in a minute as well. I can have then a, another uh, uh, configuration of the interior of this aircraft. So depending on what I have available to me from a, from a hardware perspective, I can reconfigure my view, you know, how I'm gonna participate. The controls, how I fly it, how it behaves when I, you know, try to try to fly the airplane is consistent across all those different displays. Just, it just allows some flexibility depending on what kind of hardware you have available. Um, and again, the beauty of the GL Studio piece is that I can build these widgets for whatever instrumentation or multifunction displays I need one a single time and then just reconfigure where they, you know, where they exist. In this case, they're sort of on a, just a flat uh, uh, texture here at the bottom of my screen. Um, and, you know, they give me that view. You'll notice too, another important element of the GL Studio package is that they aren't static in any way. So I'm actually going to, let me take a uh, autopilot off here. And so you'll notice as I start, you know, manually flying this aircraft, you'll notice that my various gauges and so forth are updating uh, based on what's happening in the simulation environment. So this isn't just there for display. It's actually telling me what my uh, altitude is, what my, you know, uh, um, uh, pitch is or yaw is. Um, it's telling me all that at different information. It's being updated from the simulation engine as I go in and control uh, the aircraft. Um, all of the GL Studio uh, or, or the, you know, the other piece that you can do with GL Studio is have interactive buttons. So in this case, I'm just, you know, clicking on these buttons with my mouse, but I can switch between different functionalities on my multi multifunction displays, depending again on what type of, of cockpit I want set up. I'm going to show now one other one and then I'll pause and, and take some questions. So that's, you know, a single horizontal screen. This particular demo we frequently show on multiple screens where I might have, you know, an out the window view that's going to show me my, uh, you know, the out the cockpit view uh, on one screen and then a separate monitor that would show my instrumentation panel. I can't quite do that uh, here um, because I only have a single screen that I'm sharing with you, but I can um, do this in a, a windowed fashion here. So again, same exact role uh, application. Sorry, I got to move things here, um, turn off my autopilot. And then again, I'm flying this aircraft the same way I would previously. And now again, you see my, my, uh, my instrumentation panel here, same instrumentation, same multifunction displays. I actually have two more than I had previously. Um, but again, I can interact with each of these, set them up exactly the way that I want. Um, let me make sure I don't crash here. Um, and I could have, you know, this configuration. We frequently, when we're using this two screen setup, we'll have again, one screen showing my out the window view and the second screen with all my instrumentations, uh, uh, instruments on it on a touch panel. So instead of having to reach up with my mouse to change the various multifunction displays <clears throat> here, I can actually, you know, touch those buttons on a touch, pan, uh, touch screen and have that, you know, change my display depending on what I'm doing. So those are, um, you know, two of the basic ways of being able to do this. I'm focusing at the moment um, on aircraft, mostly because um, we tend to have more complete uh, uh, sets of, of screen configurations for some of the aircraft. There's a lot more, you know, instrumentation in an aircraft than there is in, say, a ground vehicle. You can do uh, widgets or, or GL Studio elements really for anything. Um, I mean, Chris, you guys have used these for aircraft, ground vehicles. What are some other um, common use cases of people that build widgets or build capability um, using GL Studio where, where, they would, uh, where, the, where they would plug that into a user interface? Yeah, sure. So uh, GL Studio is used for, I, we've done over 200 cockpits uh, internally at DISTE, but we're used from everything from prototyping to simulation and training and embedded into your VR engaged. Um, all the way out to real instrumentation in the real aircraft. So uh, you're, you're sh you were showing a, a T-38 flight model before. Uh, the replacement for that is the TX, which is now the T-7A at Boeing. Uh, we just got our press release for adoption for GL Studio for all the avionics. And I think one, one of the big things that that brings forward is what you guys now have running in VR Engage can be the exact same content that you could actually get from from the aircraft. 
Yeah, yeah, excellent point, excellent point. And and again, one of the one of the really uh, great you know capabilities there with with uh, with GL Studio is Disney's experience in building the you know actual cockpit interiors for these various aircraft and having them you know look and feel the right way. Sometimes in that first one that I showed, we want something generic just because we want it simple. We want a quick view. Let me switch to uh, you know the next view I'm going to show here. Um, and this I'm going to bear with me here. I'm um, I'm, I'm going to try something that hopefully will work without too much issue. I'm going to use my head mounted display here and engage and I'm going to show. All right. Can everybody see that? Yep. Looks good. Can everybody sure. hear me still. Okay. Yep. Okay. So this is now, um, uh, and actually I think we decided that this looks a little bit better if I resize this. Okay, so um, so this is now again. I'm um, it's a little bit challenging to demo VR when I'm sharing on a Zoom call, but uh, um, so this is now showing um, again the same same aircraft, same um, you know flight model, but now with uh, a head-mounted display, and you can see now we're we've got a slightly different um, configuration. This is what the interior of the T38 actually looks like, and you see now I have the ability, you know, the same gauges that we have in the uh in the in the two-dimensional display i have in a three-dimensional display um i have all of the different uh uh you know uh, configuration that you would see in the actual cockpit for the t38 now again part of the reason why we have these different configurations is because not everybody has one of these not everybody has a head mounted display necessarily when they're when they're doing this kind of um you know using the vr engaged software but if you do um you can you can just by selecting the different screen configuration you're able to switch to you know this kind of a view i can zoom in here i can look at my different uh gauges um let's see if i can uh, multitask here um i have well, he's doing that let's just i'll give a big round of applause for danny williams who can not only talk sensibly about our product but can also fly an airplane <laughs> and control a head mount display without it being on his head i'm gonna try and put and it on my head <laughs> All right, we're gonna try this really quick. Um, oh, that's not what I, okay. So what you what you can't see here is in the uh, there we go. Okay, so in the in the head mounted display, when I actually turn it on, it's actually uh, I have a, a a little menu I can pull up to turn off the uh, um, autopilot, which you don't see when um, when I am. Uh, when I when I'm just sharing my screen here, so I just reset the position for the tracker. So now you can see again, like I can lean forward, I can look at my various gauges, I can fly around. The other great thing um, that this this demonstrates pretty well, and I'm kind of about to crash Don't here. Watch the ground there, Dan. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you see, you hey, you, you, uh, made, you, know, you gave me that compliment a little bit too soon. Um, <laughs> so a couple awesome of different sand dune. <laughs> hey, Danny, if you just show the 3D cockpit, you can they can see the quality better without you risking life and limb. <laughs> good point good point i just wanted to show uh the head mounted display to show a few things that's a little bit hard to see in the cockpit one you know we can actually have the uh the stick and throttle move accordingly uh based on the position that we're using um we can uh oh i wanted to just also show the lighting on the on the displays so again gl studio while building these 3d widgets um uh, does a very nice job of, of, you know, having them look and behave the way you, you expect them to, but they're also, you know, full 3d objects that we can, um, you know, have lit, uh, appropriately so that, you know, they look really nice in a, in a 3d environment. So, um, they're not just two dimensional flat things. They are things that have dimension to them. So I can look at things from the side and get, you know, a variety of, of, uh, greater detail, depending on what it is. Again, different lighting and shadow effects really look nice um, kind of in this kind of display and the uh, um, you know, mimicking what it would look like in, um, you know, in, a, in an actual cockpit. So, all right, so now to stop making that all shaky and jerky for everybody, I'm going to. So we're, we're <laughs> speaking of the head mount displays, we're also working with Vario and integrating the Vario headset into our products. So soon we'll have a demonstration of that headset, which is pretty cool because it uses multiple channels of video to get a high resolution inset in, in the front of where you look and then a, another channel to be the more, you know, provide their peripheral vision. So the combination of those two channels per eye makes for super sharp high resolution screens. Very cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, excellent point. Um, the other point about the, the Vario system um, that you can also do here, obviously in VR, there's always the question of, you know, how much of the real world do I want to be able to see or can I see at all? You know, pure VR is not showing me any of that. The Vario system that Dan just mentioned uh, also supports uh, mixed reality so that I can see the 3D cockpit, see the you know, the various instrumentation, see my out the window view, but I can also see my hands. I can look down and, and read, you know, a kneeboard if I have something like that, or, um, you know, you can, you can then do some very interesting things with, you know, mixed levels of display. Um, if I want to be able to out, reach out and touch a touch panel, instead of having all of my displays as, you know, virtual elements in the cockpit here, I can have a touch panel that I can still see through the cameras from the mixed reality system push buttons the way you, you know, would more, more realistically interact with those. So, so that's a, a very quick rundown of, um, of, of this particular uh, capability. Any questions about that? Any comments? Um, any other, uh, you know, use cases that people, that, you know, that this brings to mind for people that are doing this kind of work? I can bring up my chat window here. So short of that, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and Chris, uh, we will hand this over to you. So again, um, GL Studio Disney's product is all of the instrumentation you saw there is, is driven by that. Chris is now going to show a demonstration of uh, or, or an overview of, of the GL Studio platform and then um, uh, some demonstrations of the actual tool itself, how you build these widgets, uh, what that what that sort of workflow looks like. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Danny. Absolutely. So. Um, what I'm going to do real quick is, uh, I guess we need to we need to be able to talk about how do we get from here to there, right? And so I, I'm not a big fan of slides. Can you guys see my desk? Okay. Yep, we can see it fine. Okay, not a big fan of slides. I've got one for you guys, just one. I wanted to talk a little bit about the process of how we get to what Danny was just showing, and then we can kind of drill down a little bit until everybody cries uncle and says, okay, enough, enough information, right? <laughs> so um, left side you're looking at is GL Studio process. In the center is the uh, VR Engage, right? And on the right-hand side is any of the 3D modeling that you might want to do. So uh, GL Studio has got a number of different use cases uh, in, in VR Engage, uh, as, well as, as well as in parallel to VR Engage. So uh, obviously you use us in your desktop simulators, AR, VR. You can use us for all of the symbology and HUDs and overlays in the scene, right? Um, and so GL Studio uh, allows you to take all of the, your, your art assets and drag and drop them into the editor. And then GL Studio is going to create an application that can be a standalone application on your desktop so that you can do some prototyping, maybe build an instructor operator station that's listening for all of the VR forces information about your flight, right? Um, from there, we build a DLL that can get loaded into VR Engage. And now, GL Studio gives you the ability to expose all of those inputs and outputs so that VR Engage can then just connect to the VR, to, to the inputs and outputs from the GL Studio content, right? And so when you've got your 2D overlay on the screen and you're wanting to build this beautiful desktop uh, simulator, this is the perfect simulation. This is the perfect situation to be in. Now, say you wanted to get into a VR situation, right? There's a number of different ways you can do that with this solution. Um, so one of the best things here is uh, you can grab your 3D models on a Max. You can bring those models into VR Engage. You can bring GL Studio instrumentation in and apply it to those models so that now you get all of the visual feedback from your flight model, right, from your data model. Um, and so the nice thing there is those 3D Studio Max models can also be brought into GL Studio. So you get all of this reuse across your platform for things like your repeater panels, uh, your instructor operator stations. You can use all that same content um, for your, your FTDs, full flight sims. And as I mentioned before, even the real avionics, okay? So a lot of people will use GL Studio to prototype avionics, very detailed avionics. Um, and we're also in production with heads-up displays right now as well. So 
And I'll just, Chris, really quick, I'll point out, you know, the point you just made is a really key, again, you know, point for us. One, just the, 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 the ease with which we can use GL Studio to bring things into VR Engage. But, you know, when we start work, you know, we're doing a lot of work for the synthetic training environment uh, program right now. They have very specific, obviously, they don't want a generic cockpit. They want something that looks like not just, you know, an Apache helicopter, but the exact variant of a, of a, a Apache helicopter that they're training on. So being Absolutely. able to pull in all of that detail is extremely useful for, for our perspective, because that work has already been done. The integration's already been done, and we can just suck those models in. So just, yeah, excellent point there. Yeah, so good segue. So that gets us into, well, how do, how do I create these things? You know, why are, why are these so complicated? Um, you know, why is, it, why is it that we need to use GL Studio to build this content? Well, GL Studio gives you a visual way to uh, create all of your content uh, in 2D and 3D space. And you'll, you'll note it, oh, I gotta move this guy over here. The uh, windows are in my way, there we go. All right, so you'll notice here that, uh, you know, I've got the ability to change around my content uh, inside my screens. I can add behaviors to those. Um, and then we end up with things like, for example, this heads up display, right? Uh, or or a uh, electronic ADI. So you'll notice here that we've got an individual instrument, which is our airspeed. I can zoom into this guy, right? And what we can do in GL Studio is actually go and create behavior. So if you look at the airspeed, we've created a class property here that gives us a place where we can go and program how that airspeed indicator is gonna work. So we're dynamically rotating the the needle and at the same time we're outputting the airspeed so that that text object we were just looking at can visualize it right now all of these class properties that we create in here that's what that's what vr engage connects to and so you can send your role your pitch your altitude your airspeed to all of these different objects that you see on this page right so this shows you how to do that connection um, from, from a simple 2D standpoint. Now, um, from more of a 3D application standpoint, now remember I said you can grab 3D Studio Max content, bring that into GL Studio, right? Well, here's a good example of that, where we're marrying 2D and 3D content in the same cockpit, right? And so if we go and take a closer look, we've got our, uh, our EADI right here. And, and that EADI panel, just like before, you'll notice we've got all of the content modeled in there, including all of these different properties, just for that one panel. Everything from showing the heading to showing the alti altimeter tape, uh, you know, button activity for push buttons, um, you know, pitch, roll, airspeed, everything is in this one tiny little piece, uh, one single instrument that is part of the entire cockpit that you see right here. Okay. So yeah. all and of again, that. This is another generated... Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, this is another great example of, of, again, just in our content creation pipeline, when we're building something like the T-38, being able to bring in our 3D model of the interior and then making sure that all the pieces are placed in the right location, all the GL Studio pieces are placed in the right location is really extremely valuable for our, from our perspective so that there's, it kind of takes the guesswork out of it. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that goes back to that uh, human factors and prototyping uh, bullet that I had on the slide there, right? Exactly. So a lot of times people are using this to make sure that it's doing exactly what they want. So in this case, for example, uh, I've got a running application. Uh, it, hopefully it's coming through smoothly on your side, um, but I'm yeah, able to- good on my side. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm able to uh, navigate around in here, uh, you know, interact with things in 3D space, just as a standalone application. And, and you know, where, where VR Engage comes in is when this needs to be in a scene and connected to uh, an actual simulation, right? So I can actually uh, run some test variables here so you can see everything active. I know it's kind of a little bit of a, uh, uh, little bit of a, 
color burst the patterns there, right? Um, but that's, those are just highlights showing that everything is uh, being activated. So those are all the things in here that have behaviors attached to them. That's right? pretty cool. And, and then okay. from there, and, and, um, that really, really gets us question. back to this process. Danny, you were trying to cut in? He's frozen. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Wow, it looks like there's uh, quite a few uh, questions popping up. <laughs> so I guess I'll go ahead with that and hand it back off to you, Danny. Well, let's see if we can answer some of these questions. I think Danny seized up over on his end. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Can you have the navigator of one ship using HMI and the other ship in a task group conducting ship maneuvers for officer training? And the answer to that, I think, is beyond the scope of just the man-machine interface of one vehicle, but those kinds of things can be done by building a simulation environment that includes multiple vehicles and playing them out. And that can be done with multiple VR engage simulators or VR forces to have a CGF level simulation of some of them and VR engage for manned players in others. Um, and, but absolutely our systems are all designed to be connected together on simulation networks so that you can pull off exactly those kinds of things. Absolutely. And, and the GL Studio content uh, would be connecting to the same system, the same simulation, right? And so you could have multiple cockpits, multiple dashboards, all connected into the same, uh, same simulation from Mach and, and reading and writing all of that data back and forth from your interactions. Let's see, it says, I assume these started from 3D models in AutoCAD or something and were imported into GL Studio. So Chris, can you talk about which different kinds of modeling formats you can take in? Yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty centered around 3D Studio Max, um, but we also have OBJ importer, ASE importer, a DSI importer. Um, but it just so happens that our 3D Studio Max one is, uh, is very verbose, uh, gives you lots of uh, activity and it just so happens to work perfectly with VR Engage as well. So you, you get lots of use out of the exact same 3D model, right? So, so there's, a, there's a good one in here as well, uh, Dan, that's uh, can you show uh, how you transition to night vision in the cockpit? Um, so that's actually a great, uh, a great question. And I'm gonna come into this design real quick and I'm going to show you guys something. So inside here, we have what we call uh, eye points, right? So I'm going to go at a higher level, and you'll see we've got one eye point that governs the entire scene, everything that you're looking at. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Okay. So what happens with that eye point, right? Um, and you can see it in the case of this example, I can move that eye point around, right? And similarly, in, in VR Engage, we can attach that eye point such that it will show the content from the VR Engage scene and overlay it onto a texture that gets rewritten every frame uh, right in the middle of your MFD. So that, that's actually a really good question. We get that a lot. Right, so, so that's an important feature you point out, the ability to take sensor, sensor data from, or rendered sensor images from the simulation application and put them in the, inside the displays. Night vision or electro-optical or any other kind of sensor information can be, can be posted yeah. into those displays as well. And of Absolutely. course, when you put this simulation in, in a simulated environment in VR Engage where you're in the world, we could change the rendering you know, of the world outside to appear as if it was through your night vision goggles if you chose to do it that way. But generally speaking, the pilots will be in their aircraft and, and it's only through sensors that they will see these you know, night vision or infrared and whatnot. So a typical pattern for doing that is to display them in the multifunction displays or as overlays on your heads up display. Absolutely. So, so Danny's, Danny dropped out because his home network crashed and he's rebooting his router at home and he'll, he'll join us in a little while. And be able no to worries. 
Hey, uh, Dan, I got good. Here's a good one for you that I just saw. So what Back. protocol is used to interface between VR and gauge aircraft models in the HMI display? That's a great question. Hey everybody, I'm back. I, my uh, my network just totally died. Sorry about that. Um, please continue, Chris. You but clearly you recovered are... pretty quickly, so that's yeah. yeah. Not... Did you yeah. even notice I was gone? No. Yes, right. we noticed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we noticed whenever you leave us. <laughs> very, very good. You, that was I, I had just seen that that question as well, uh, Chris. So continue. So this uh, where's this question? This question is what's the what's the protocol between the HMI and VR Engage? I would call yes, that sir. API. Yeah. But I don't actually, I've never done it myself, Chris. Maybe you can explain how that works. Yeah, sure. So um, if you remember in GL Studio, we're just creating very basic connections to the HMI, right? You can use whatever protocol you need to. So if you want HLA, DIS, if you're, if you're just using some UDP data going over a network, right? Um, you can connect directly to the HMI that's then being shown in Engage. And Engage has their own interface as well, uh, to, like, like Danny was showing earlier, to uh, VR forces. So we can listen for all of that data, no matter what the protocol is. But that's a great question. Yeah. So there's, there's a refined question on there, sort of, um, when GL Studio generates a DLL, are the functions all defined by GL Studio internally? Or can the user define custom functions to control each part of the particular instrument panel? Yeah, another good question. So um, I'm going to go back to I'm going to go back to my um, my example here with the electronic uh, um, ADI, right? Where we've got our pitch and our roll. So these um, properties we created. I'm going to go to my code editor now. The pitch, the roll, the altitude, the airspeed. Those were all created um, in GL Studio. So if I want to create a new property. I can say, um, you know, come inside here and say it's a type int and say uh, mock rocks, right? <laughs> now I've got my, my mock rocks uh, property name, and I can go ahead and start creating my own interface to those objects that we had over here. So I can control them however I want. Now I've got a new way to connect VR Engage to the GL Studio based content. So great question. Again, you guys are loaded with them. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, what we've done with our integration of GL Studio is, is integrated so that, you know, these functions already exist within our code. So engineers can just say, oh, I'm, I, I know I'm updating an altimeter. So I already know the function call I need to pass into that to, to update that GL Studio widget. Um, that's all been, been tightly integrated on our side. But as, as Chris said, you know, if you're using GL Studio can be used, you know, outside of mock products and in other applications. So um, there's a number of different ways that you can interface with it. So it's a bit extremely flexible in that sense. So Chris, how, how, how much education would one need to jump in and create your own interface? Uh, you know, that's a great question. Um, so basically any, any, so you guys know we're right across the street from UCF. Right, University of Central Florida, largest university in the in the states right now. Um, they got a really strong engineering program, uh, digital media program. Uh, we once hired a kid straight out of the digital media program that had some uh, some good art skills, some scripting skills, knew how to web program. We put him through our uh, four day GL Studio training class. Uh, and within one week, he was able to finish uh, a very base level F-16 simulator, including a HUD as well. So, you know, if, if you've got a good understanding of programming, you're going to do really well with this. If you've got some basic scripting uh, capabilities, you'll, you'll get it really, really well. Uh, a lot of it has to do with, you know, the, the graphics layouts and, and how are you with Photoshop as well. Um, how are you with, um, um, you know, 3D Studio Max, if, you're, if your goal is to create 3D-based content like you see here. Uh, so, you know, it's, it really kind of encompasses a lot of different types of, um, of expertise. So, I, I would just point out, too, though, I, th I think, you know, where I think we at Mock frequently find ourselves is that, you know, we might have you know, we have an art team that can develop the 3D content. Um, and then, 
you know, to hand that off to, to an engineer that can then say, okay, now I want to map, you know, um, you know, the, the functionality of this display or this instrument back to something I know that the simulation does on the back end. So, you know, there are, there are elements of this, I think, pipeline that, that um, you know, the 3D content might already be created and it's just a question of linking it up uh, appropriately that, that really, you know, again, simplifies some of that workflow. So you don't have to be a Renaissance man. You, and you know it have, all. That's exactly my point people. is that if, 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 uh, if you don't know all of that yourself frequently, I think we find that you've got a team that, you know, blends some of that expertise. Absolutely. So uh, a question, um, what's the benefit of customers using this combination of products and training? Um, what's your why? It's a great question. So from my standpoint, I think, you know, I, I'll give you my answer on that. I think probably lots of people could answer that uh, different ways. I think, you know, there, what, what this partnership between Mock and Disty has created in VR Engage is a product that has a very clear pipeline um, that if you want to create custom training interfaces, custom training, uh, you know, human in the loop uh, interfaces where you're going to, you, you know, it's, you've got a specific end uh, 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 use case in mind, you've got a very clear pipeline of how to go about doing that. You don't have to, as, you know, as Chris was saying, you might, you know, if you don't have any of that infrastructure, you might have to build all the 3D content and then, you know, do a bunch of Photoshop work to get the textures all correct and then link in GL Studio. All of that work uh, of the connectivity between those different pieces has already been done from our perspective. So then it's just a question of how do I want to customize it? What, what GL Studio element do I want to put in, inside of this, uh, this 3D content? All of it's reusable. I mean, one of the beautiful things about the GL Studio product is you might create, you know, a, a, an instrument, a widget of some kind or a, a couple variations of that. And that can be reused across any number of different platforms, you know aircraft interiors all look very different depending on what the platform is, but everybody's got an altimeter. Everybody uses multifunction displays in some way, shape or form. And so there's a lot of reuse that you gain from utilizing the GL Studio product. And then again, the, the ability to kind of plug that into an existing architecture on the VR Engage side, um, we have found to be a very useful uh, kind of approach to, to things. So we're getting some, a bunch of questions here. Uh, please keep them coming. Um, Chris, do you, this is an example from uh, Jonathan. Do you have an example of an object with deeply embedded behavior? Uh, for example, using a CDU in the cockpit for FMS. Wow. Yeah. I don't no, understand. So, I don't understand that question at all. So yeah, I'm, explain. I'm glad that was geared towards you. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, no, we, we get that quite a bit. Um, so we, we have uh, recently actually just uh, started a new program for the FAA uh, that we were able to get press on, where we're building out the entire uh, cockpit, including all the CDUs. So when you were looking, for example, at, um, let's go down here real quick. Chris, what are CDUs? Central display unit or, um, yeah, there's a number of different um, meanings for said acronym, but uh, FMS is uh, the, a similar kind of a layout where you've got something that's got button after button after button and lots of interfaces, and then you've got a screen inside that can be hundreds and hundreds of pages deep right. in that content, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the contract that we just won with the FAA, we're building out a full 737 MAX uh, simulator for R&D, and that includes all of the actual uh, display framework, the, the CDU, the FMS. Um, so yeah, they, they can get very complicated. They can go quite deep. Uh, and, and remember, uh, we're also used in, in full aircraft, in the actual uh, aircraft that, that goes into production. So GL Studio generated code and runtime library is actually flying in, in real aircraft and spacecraft today. We're actually being used in just about every major space endeavor um, in the United States. So, so the, the, that work can go from, from the prototype level of really how do I want this to look all the way through the life cycle of whatever that, with that display or, or widget has to be to the actual operational piece of uh, operational aircraft or, or spaceship or whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and VR Engage is a big part of that pipeline as well. When you start getting to the desktop simulators, when you start getting to the AR and VR uh, cockpits, right? So you get familiarization, you get the same out the window scene 
uh, view. Um, but but like I mentioned before, right, there, there's a lot you can do with GL Studio um, on either side of that spectrum, right. too, that brings you from prototyping into the cockpit. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, again, Mock has been in, in some situations where we've been asked, you know, um, when you're talking about um, operational flight software, um, whether or not you want to emulate that, you know, simulate its effects and in, in all of the different pages and screens that you can scroll through or integrate, you know, actual OFP software that you would, that you would integrate maybe in a black box fashion. And GL Studio provides a great platform for being able to emulate that so that you can, again, do it all in a virtual environment. It tends to be much more um, uh, uh, efficient when you're, when you're integrating it into a larger simulation system. So it's a great approach um, from that perspective. Um, has GL Studio ever been used to create an iOS? Absolutely. Uh, actually, our, our first contract was um, to create an instructor operator station for the uh, for the A10 for the Air Force Research Labs. <laughs> so good. yeah, we're we're used pretty heavily for iOS's repeater panels, um, lots of full flight sims. A lot of uh, a lot of people have used us for full flight sims that have been through uh, FTD certifications as well, um, which again. You know, it's it's a great it's a great engagement for uh, VR engage as well, no pun intended there, uh, to be able to use something that produces instrumentation that can get the highest level of certification for flight simulators. Definitely, definitely, yeah. I was going to point out that we, um, you know, we've been highlighting uh, VR engage again, the human in the loop piece, but but you know, our integration with GL Studio goes back even before VR engage even existed, so. Again, we had customers that would want to build their own custom cockpits. We would want to have custom interfaces for a variety of applications. So that's really where the whole integration started many years ago is to say, let's have a platform in which you can, you can quickly add this. And again, maybe, um, you know, one example, we keep talking about the example of, of training a pilot, training somebody to do something, but there's a whole, you know, a whole line of, of science behind human machine interfaces and how they should be designed and where you should put information in the display. We've got a number of customers that more on that research side have said, let's use this environment to create custom, um, you know, human machine interface, human machine interfaces, and then put a human in, not to train them, but to then test them and get, do analysis on how effective is, is this approach for displaying information versus this. You know, get into all kinds of different questions about, um, you know, pilots being distracted, um, you know, just cognitive workload that a pilot or uh, a UAV operator might be under while they're, while they're conducting a mission. Being able to have a platform to simulate that and do that analysis, again, is another, another interesting use case kind of in the same, in the same vein. Yeah, and I think that actually speaks really well to a question from Udo here as well. Good to see you, Udo. Um, so where, where does this fit into the pilot training pipeline and, and how does that fit into the training needs analysis? So that, that covered it perfectly. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. There's, a, there's uh, and again, we've got a number of different customers that have gone, you know, that have used, again, not just VR Engage, but some of our other uh, applications as well to, to kind of build up that type of interface. So it's, it's so, uh, I have a great one here, Danny. Go um, for it. So, so we got we got a question on uh, <laughs> with a smiley face. It says, "I wonder why the 737 Max simulation <laughs> module is needed." <laughs> uh, yeah. be, be it known that GL Studio was not used in the original production version of the 737 Max. There you go. But we are being used to help solve problems from the FAA standpoint. So that's a good thing. Very Great good question. <laughs> yes, yes, very good question. So, so another question about the uh, this. In emulation mode, does it run at the same speed as the embedded hardware runtime? <clears throat> so the the speed that you get uh, on the application running on an embedded target system is very dependent on how many polygons you have, how many vertices, how much texture memory you're using, and how fast your bus is. Uh, on the hardware, as well as how fast your CPU, your GPU, and how much memory you got. So we uh, typically, when we're when we're doing things like automotive applications, people want to see 60 frames or better, which we have no problem obtaining because um, it's generated C++ code. 
doesn't get any faster than that, right? Unless you want to start writing an assembly, which I really don't recommend. <laughs> um, but for the aircraft, for, for aerospace, usually we see about 30, uh, 30 hertz as requirements a lot. Um, we're seeing 60 more and more now, but from the GL Studio side, we don't have any problems hitting that. We're really only drawing things that you're seeing on the screen for whichever page you're on on the avionics. It's pretty efficient. Right. Right. That's another, it's, it's a very good question though, too. I think there's, there's a, a number of different use cases when you're talking about, you know, you know, running in real time, running, you know, uh, you know, managing those things. There's all kinds of examples of people that, that will do hardware in the loop type simulations. They want to, yeah. they want to be able to run at the rate that an actual embedded system is going to run. And so there's lots of different, I mean, that, that could be a whole nother topic of, of kind of embedded systems and how you tie simulated systems to, um, you know, real time systems and, and the various implications of doing that and what you need to, you know, what you need to manage, how you would manage that. But, um, but yeah, another, great, Danny, another great question. I think I think what that question's really implying is, can you guys run with an RTOS? <laughs> right, right, right. And, and the answer there is definitely, yeah, we do work with all kinds of RTOSs all the time, the safety critical and, and standard uh, real-time operating systems. Yeah, excellent point, excellent point. Very good. Just keep the questions coming, uh, guys. This is this is great. Um, and Chris, this is this has been great. We're we're getting close to the one o'clock mark. What we've done typically, um, just as as we you know, start to wrap this up, we're happy to stick around. Chris, I don't know if you're able to stick around for a few extra minutes, but uh, if yeah, you do have questions, if you want to see any other um, um, elements of the software, want to ask other questions, please feel free to uh, to stick around. Um, we'll keep going through uh, up until one o'clock. Uh, obviously, some people have to get back to work and and uh, quit their lunch hour. But um, I want to say thank you to Chris very much. Uh, I think this has been great, a great platform for uh, bringing our, our our partners in to kind of show kind of common capability there. Um, and again, we don't need to wrap up yet. I just wanted to make sure for folks that did need to leave um, uh, that we're going to be doing this for the rest of this week. We've got uh, what are our sessions for tomorrow and Thursday, Dan or Rob? Uh, tomorrow is Wargaming Wednesday. Right. Wargaming Wednesday. Wargaming Wednesday. Yep. And then I believe we're doing a VR exchange discussion on Thursday. Is that correct? V VR exchange. No, we always encourage participation from uh, our viewers and stuff. And we actually had Peter Grimm suggest uh, VR exchange and some of the work he's done with that. So he's going to be um, our special guest on Thursday and showing us uh, some of the stuff he's worked on with VR exchange. Great. Great. So yeah, Wargaming Wednesday tomorrow, talking about the uh, how some of our software is used uh, to do Wargaming type applications, a little bit different than a human in the loop type application. Um, but again, something that, uh, that we have a lot of customers, you know, working in that ar arena. And then VR Exchange, not to be confused with VR Engage. VR Exchange is our, <laughs> VR Exchange is our uh, uh, networking protocol translator. So it's an application that can take, if you're using a DIS application, uh, and you want to translate that this network traffic to a different protocol to HLA or vice versa. VR Exchange is an application that does that, but also has the ability to go far beyond that if you have custom protocols that you're trying to interface with, um, being able to write custom brokers that allow you to do that. So that's Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, again, hopefully everyone will, will be able to come back. And um, we don't forget Intercontinental Breakfast. Right. For all of you who might want to uh, stay up till eight or nine o'clock in the evening or get up at eight in the morning if you're in Singapore or the Pacific and lunchtime in Australia, we'll be doing the, we'll be doing the new features in the Mach 1 product line, which is always a great topic to show off all the cool new stuff. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's 9 a.m. Singapore time, 9 p.m. Eastern time here. Right. That's right. 9 p.m. Wednesday night here, Thursday morning. But look, the most important question of the day, I asked it earlier, but a lot of you weren't here then, so I'm going to real quickly give you a question. I'd like to see your answers in the chat window. Yeah, we've got, got quite a few more people two New York strip steaks, and you're going to cook one sous vide style and one on the grill. <laughs> now, this is an experiment that I'm going to do tonight, and I'll give you the results tomorrow, but I would like your estimation of what you think is going to come out better, sous vide or grilled. And apparently, I need to send out my pizza recipe as well. Yeah, and and I, I, think, I think in general, uh, you know, this, this question came about because <laughs> when Dan and Chris and I got on early, uh, we started just chatting and Dan asked that question. And it turns out everybody's 
clearly doing a lot of cooking at home right now. So I think they can't spell sous vide. I think that's the <laughs> I can't. <laughs> so uh, isn't it, uh, is it, I think it's spelled like that. Is that right? No, <laughs> no, it's, it's not. It's not. A, it's not a lady's name in, in last initial. No. No. <laughs> All right. So, so thanks for the input there. We're going to go ahead and answer a few more questions. I see a few more actual non uh, uh, grilling questions coming across. Um, Everyone's people, going grill, grill, grill. That's crazy. <laughs> Try something. So we have a correct spelling. Is that the correct spelling? Got to be on here, and they're going to know how to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're gonna we're gonna wrap up with this last question here from RJM. Does GL Studio handle high level dependencies between multiple widgets and simulation conditions? For a sophisticated HMI, how are higher level logical dependencies handled for the widgets? For example, yep. a new state is determined because the sum of two two uh, raw sensor uh, data feeds. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Um, the, the, you have to remember we're generating object-oriented code, right? So each GL Studio design is its own base class, which can be included into parent level classes. And so you get this nested tree structure of the GL Studio design framework, which means you can load any class that's inside that DLL. So um, in my MFD example, right, I had one parent MFD application. And then inside that, I had four separate pages. And then inside those pages, I had different widgets that the different pages were all using. And so that kind of shows that uh, dependency level and how detailed you can go. Um, and there's really no limit to, uh, to the levels you can go uh, uh, in depth. And the real power to being able to do that is, say you've got 500 pages on an MFD, and you've got 200 clocks uh, that are in five different configurations on all these different pages in your MFD, right? You make the clock one time and you make it encompass all possible permutations and then you include it in all these different locations. So if anything needs to change, you change it once and it bubbles up to all the use cases. And once you get to that top level, that's where we create the interface so that VR Engage can pass data to it so you know what time it is in the simulation, for example, right? Right. That's Perfect. a great question though. Perfect. Yeah, great, thank you. So that a uh, great, great question to wrap it up. I'll, I'll, I'll close out here again. We'll stick around if there's a few more questions. Um, Chris, what's the best place if people wanna learn more about GL Studio, wanna contact somebody about getting an eval or ask more questions? What's the best route for doing that? Yeah, actually go to glstudio.disti.com, D-I-S-T-I.com. Uh, and you can also email us at uh, sales at disti.com. We'll get you guys engaged with the, with the right people. Uh, or feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or through my email at cgiordano at disti.com. Great, great. And I just yeah. dropped that website and an email address in the uh, – in the chat window there. So definitely uh, reach out to, to Chris if you have questions. If you're interested in learning more about how Mock uses that, um, want to get more under the hood in terms of how we've integrated GL Studio, as always, you can email info at mock.com. Uh, that'll go to uh, me and the rest of the folks on the sales team, and we're happy to, to get back in touch with you. Um, these discussions at lunch have been great. They've spurred a lot of other kind of sidebar conversations, people <clears throat> wanting to learn more about various pieces people wanting to suggest other topics for uh, lunch with mock uh, ideas. So please keep all of that coming. You can, again, similar to, to uh, DISTI, you can engage with us via email, LinkedIn, Twitter, any of those avenues we'll, we'll track and would love that feedback. Would love to know um, other topics people are interested in for future ones, uh, set, lunch with mock sessions. Uh, but also if you'd like to peel off and have a separate conversation about a particular problem or task that you're having, please feel free to reach out to us. If it's a direct GL Studio question, please reach out to them. We work very closely together. So finally, Chris, thank you again. Really appreciate it. I thought this was great. Yeah. Thank you guys very much for having us. We really appreciate it. You know, the, the partnership over the last 18, 19 years has been outstanding and continues to get better all the time. So definitely very, very appreciative for your time, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Good thank see you, you again, Chris. Chris. Everybody Chris, else, guys. take care, Cheers. be safe. Uh, again, we'll stick around if anybody has any last minute questions, but thank you all for joining us. Thank you, mock people for supporting. It's great seeing you and hope to see you tomorrow at lunch.